Good morning, everybody. I'm New Center Rain Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. I'm joined now by Republican analyst Phil Harriman and Democrat Ethan Strimling. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good, Good to morning, see you. Zach. Good to see you, Phil. I want to start things off with the asylum seeker crisis. Portland Mayor Kate Snyder sent a letter to Governor Janet Mills this week describing the challenges and calling for state level resources to provide services to people seeking asylum, additional shelters in other parts of the state, more general assistance funds. The City Council even postponed a vote on its budget to see if the state will provide that additional funding. Phil, I want to start with you. For what seems like years, the city has been asking the state to take more action here, not just have Portland shoulder the burden. Is what they're asking for fair? Uh, I think it is. You know, this is one of these policies that sounded great that, you know, Portland's going to be a sanctuary city. You can come here and feel safe. And now we've gotten much more than we expected, and we don't have the resources to uh, support them in the way that is humane. And so uh, uh, the policy now is where are you going to find the money to make sure these people get the access to the housing and health care that they need. And the states are washing money, and I suspect the city of Portland isn't. <laughs> Ethan? Yeah, yeah I, you know, it's, I, I think it's really important. I think the conversation has changed, that we understand that the uh, the immigrants that are coming here are really an opportunity for the state. And when I was mayor, we opened up the expo the first time. We had a big influx. And Governor Mills came down and really celebrated who had come here. And good for her for doing that. And I think Mayor Snyder is correct. The state needs to help step up in terms of trying to make sure that everyone who comes here stays here, is able to get grounded, and can help build our economy for Why the future. Why has the governor avoided this issue? I, I, I really don't know, but I think you know this is this is part and parcel of the much larger national issue. We've had such an intense inflection of of people uh, coming to our country that all, all the cities, all of the border states are overwhelmed, and I think it, it encourages, at least for me, the Biden administration to take us, you know put a stop to the border crossings for the time being and, and solve the problems that we already have. All right. I want to switch gears now to a scary situation for Maine Secretary of State Shenna Bellows. She shared in an event last weekend that she received a credible threat against her life on social media. We asked her about it. Take a listen to what she had to say. I am very fortunate. I have an amazing team, including members of law enforcement who work for the Department of Secretary of State. I feel very well protected by my team. But your average election clerk at the municipal level doesn't have any sort of protection uh, against these threats that might occur. Ethan, this is obviously at a time when things are really ramping up for 2024. A lot of distrust still out there post-Trump. So does this surprise you? No, it doesn't. I mean, look, as an elected official, these things happen. When I was in the Senate, um, I had a letter sent to me that said, we're going to shoot you if you go to a public hearing on gun control. Um, when I was mayor, I got really anti-Semitic attacks and, and again, our state attorney general had to come in and investigate. The police had to um, increase uh, protection. And, you know, it's really unfortunate the times that we live in that these kind of things are happening. I'm glad that Secretary of State Bellows is making it clear what's going on. Our local election clerks have to be safe. And I hope the crazies who are out there that are doing these kind of a, these uh, threats uh, will back off. Bill, has this kind of worsened over the years in your mind? Well, actually, I don't think it has. Uh, uh, not to leave Ethan alone, I remember as a Republican state senator, uh, I received uh, voicemail messages that were very threatening, and I had to get the state police uh, to investigate the source of the call and whether it was credible. So uh, these things happen from time to time, but clearly they're more, I think we are so polarized today politically that the emotions can rise very rapidly, and I think uh, Secretary Bellows is correct in making sure that our town clerks are, are protected. Yeah, and speaking of elections, believe it or not, Tuesday is election day. Portland has a referendum on rent control changes. There's a special election in House District 45. That's Lincoln County after Representative Clinton Collimore resigned. Phil, let's start with question A in Portland. There's been a lot of talk around of the ongoing battle between uh, landlords and tenants. They want to roll back a cap on on rent hikes. Are landlords right here? Uh, I think they are, but I don't think they have the votes. I'm not sure that's gonna gonna pass. And I, as I understand it, when someone voluntarily leaves the rental unit and the landlord expends money to improve it, that they can build those costs uh, into the new rent. And I think that's the essential part of the question. And to your to your question, yeah, I agree. That that does make sense that it should pass politically. I don't think it's going to. And Ethan, I know you're involved in this yeah. campaign on, on the no side of things. So I am. Yeah, I'm a volunteer on the campaign, was involved in the um, passing of rent control and then the strengthening of rent control in 2020 and 2022. 
Um, I think, you know, my brother from another mother over here, he's ideologically a little <laughs> bit uh, off the base, but he's right on in terms of, I think, his political uh, prognosis. I do think that this will fail. You know, the establishment has really come out and said, um, the way to deal with our housing crisis is not to provide landlords with an opportunity to raise the rent even more, and that's what this would allow them to do on a turnover. So um, I, I think that question, eight, question A will fail on Tuesday. And um, It's also hard to get people out. It is. It's going to be a very low. We are expecting below 10,000 people. Yeah. You know, in a year when Biden gets elected, there's 40,000 people. So it gives you a pretty clear distinction. All right. I want to wrap up with this. Maine is one step closer to bringing back the original Maine flag. The House narrowly passed a bill to do just that this week. The 1901 pine tree and blue star were on the state's first flag, which was replaced in 1909 by the current flag showing the state seal over a deep blue background. The pine tree flag has gained a wave of popularity in recent years. Ethan, help me understand. Why are people so divided on this? I don't know. I, I like the flag, but you know what? I actually like the proposal to send it out to the voters to let them to vote on it. I, yes. I think that's a good idea. I'm on the side of let the voters decide on it. This is not a life or death big policy issue. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm so glad. Yeah, so the Senate approved an amendment this week to, to send it to voters. Uh, yeah. Is that the right path to take on this Well, bill? no, I think, gee, uh, <laughs> the bill finally gets to the floor of the House and the, and the Senate to pass it, and now they want to punt it out to the voters. That's going to create a whole other election process and discussion, and we'll have to talk about it again. It's going to give us yeah. lots it's of just like to make talk the about. decision. Right? Right? Yeah, make a yeah, decision. But it'll be fun. I think the whole state will have the debate. This is this is a fun, this is not like life or death, rent control, health care. This is like let's have a fun debate about yeah, the flag. Fun reason to get to the polls. Exactly. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break. The weekend morning report is back right after this. I'm joined once again by Republican analyst Phil Harriman and Democrat Ethan Strimley. Thanks for staying with us. Good morning. Good to, Good to see you. The big national news this week. Former President Donald Trump indicted on federal charges for his handling of classified documents taken from the White House to his Margot Lago estate. Trump is facing 37 felony counts. Still a lot is up in the air, but Ethan, we know uh, there's a lot that's happened in this week. The federal investigation, it wasn't just into the documents. It's also possible it was into January 6th. You have Steve Bannon who was subpoenaed. Uh, what is the fallout going to be here for Trump? You know, twice impeached, twice indicted. You know, I'm glad we live in a republic and not in, uh, you know, a, a kingdom anymore where you're, you know, where anybody is above the law. And it's clear that Donald Trump is not above the law. You know, the, the, the important part of this indictment is clearly that there was both intentionality on the part of Trump to keep these documents. He has said in private recordings and publicly that he was allowed to have them when he was not, and obstruction. Intentionality and obstruction are the two things that are gonna, you know, put that have created this indictment and have put him in this much trouble. Whether the political consequences of this are going to knock him out of the Republican primary, I hope more Republicans are like Phil Harriman and stand up and say that this guy should not be in office anymore. But so far, um, we've never seen anything knock him out. So it's disappointing that the Republican Party isn't stronger in indicting this guy. Yeah, because he said on his social media platforms that he's not responsible for this, that he, it's, it's a fraud, um, his, his typical go-to lines. But that seems to only harden his base, right, Phil? Yeah, I don't think his base is going to go anywhere. And there is, uh, I think, somewhat of a backlash now. The, the, the case in New York City created a bump for him. This one in Miami will. I suspect there's going to be another indictment in Georgia, and this is the you know the front runner and a former president. We're going to find out uh, in the months ahead whether or not Americans' justice system is truly blind, because he has the right to say, "I did nothing wrong. I am innocent." Uh, that's why we have a court system to determine the outcome. Do you believe he is? I I don't know enough about the indictment details to determine whether. Uh, a former president on his way out the door who took documents with him violated the law. I but Ethan, it's about not just the, the fact that he took the documents with him, it's that he prevented, perhaps prevented them and, from and going back the case, to where they should And there been. is a case there, I would presume. I mean, that, that, that's the important part. Well, look, when James Comey was looking into this around Hillary Clinton, he made very clear the standard is intentionality and obstruction, and she did not. Did she make w mistakes? Should she have known better? Of course. But Trump intentionally took them, has said so, 
and then obstructed them by moving them around. That's the issue. Yeah, and this comes as the GOP field to defeat Trump continues to grow. This week, Chris Christie and Mike Pence, as well as Doug Burgum, entered the fold. That makes a total of 10, at least. <laughs> the former vice president did not hold back at his campaign kickoff, taking aim at his former running mate, Donald Trump, talking about January 6th. Take a listen. On that fateful day, President Trump's words were reckless. They endangered my family and everyone at the Capitol. But the American people deserve to know that on that day, President Trump also demanded that I choose between him and the Constitution. Now voters will be faced with the same choice. All right, so I want to do something a little differently here because I know what your opinions on, on that matter will be. We want to go candidate by candidate, at least the ones that announced this week, and say chance or no chance and maybe just a, a quick reason why. So I want to start things off with Chris Christie. Chance or no chance, Ethan? Uh, no chance. I think the photos on the beach have done him in, so <laughs> he's got no chance, but he'll be fun. Well, <laughs> uh, I agree, no, no chance. I think he's in the race just to create havoc for uh, Trump and uh, call out his uh, you know, his leadership style at every chance he can. Mike Pence, though, might be able to be someone who, who does actually distinguish himself, chance or no chance there. Uh, I think that he has a chance, and here's why. Because his cons he's very conservative on the social issues. Pat Robertson, who died this week, you know, he really set the Republican Party on this path around a very conservative backlash against the LGBT community, uh, against African American community, et cetera. That's a strong base in Iowa, and I think that Pence has a little bit of a chance with that Christian conservative base. Bill? Uh, I, I agree that Christian conservative base is going to rally behind Pence. I don't think uh, that's enough to get him the, the nomination. It might make him a formidable uh, vice presidential candidate uh, choice again. And Doug Burgum? Who? <laughs> no chance. <laughs> Both of you, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as I understand, a very wealthy uh, individual, governor, governor of North Carolina, so maybe he's going to spend enough of his own money to tell us who he is. Yeah, I was but, actually thinking, I don't know if we had the video play in time, but his <laughs> announcement was the most polished of all of them, mm, if you mm. saw just the kind of production value of it. Yeah. So, and so I, he has the cash. Yeah, and I want to be clear, my, my chance is... Trump is going to get the nomination. So when I'm saying chance, it's a small chance if for some reason Trump is in jail. Although even then, I'm not sure he might still win the nomination. So, All right. Speaking of campaigns, Maine Independent Senator Angus King appears to be gearing up for a campaign launch. His website, AngusKingForMaine.com, has been revamped a bit. Includes a new logo, Angus 2024. A spokesperson would not comment on if or when the senator plans to formally announce. However, they did tell New Center Maine late last year that King feels there is still plenty of work to be done. Billy has just over $400,000 in the bank. There's a Democrat running in Brunswick who admits that he's a long shot. Uh, why not just launch? Yeah, I, I don't get it. I, I received that email with the 2024 banner on it. That told me all I needed to know. And, and if I uh, need, if there was any doubt, at the bottom of the page was a place to fill out information and send money. I uh, kind of think he's running, don't you? <laughs> yeah, for sure he's running. And, you know, he had a big health scare, so I think there was some delay in terms of whether he was going to make that decision. But uh, I think he is. He's done a very good job. I'm glad he's going to run again. He's certainly important to the Democratic majority up there. So uh, I think Democrats will probably rally behind him. Yeah. For him, I guess it's like it doesn't really matter when he announces. Right. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Right. He's <laughs> And the 400000 doesn't matter. He'll raise what he needs very quickly. All right. Wrap it up with winners and losers. Phil, we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, my loser this week is the committee in the legislature that is uh, planning to introduce amendments to a bill that froze property taxes for Maine homeowners age 65 and older. It hasn't been in place for a year, and they want to come back and revamp it and tinker with it. But uh, we need some consistency in property tax relief. Uh, my winner this week is all of the... Uh, local candidates for city and town councils and school boards who have stepped forward to run for office uh, elections the next Tuesday. Go vote. Mm. And another loser, oh. the weather. Yes. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm with you on that one, that's for sure. Uh, my winners and losers are going to be predictive, okay? So when we come back, uh, n the next time you and I are on, we'll have... Uh, we'll be able to see if I was correct on it. My winner is going to be the Democrat in the special election that you mentioned earlier. 
I think Republicans are terrible at special elections, as you know, and I think the Democrat will take it, even though that's a tight race. And I think my loser of the week is going to be the landlords in Portland when question A passes. We shall see. Question A fails, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> and that's good. <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> yeah. That's going to do it for Political Brew. Your morning report is back right after this.